Please welcome to the stage James Fontanella Khan of Financial Times and John Kadunas of Calamos Investments. Hello, everyone. John, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. Um, so John doesn't really need much of an introduction. He's got more than three decades experience in, in finance and investment. He sits on multiple boards, um, kind of trustee of the Hellenic uh, National Museum. Um, so it's like, let's start with the kind of maybe broader question of like, where do you see ourselves in the kind of the global macroeconomic picture and kind of how is it impacting markets? Well, it's, uh, of course, it's very interesting times, right? Um, uh, that we're living in now. Everybody's looking at uh, this inflation mm -hmm. and what's happening across the world, not just the United States, but uh, everywhere, mm -hmm. right? And it's affecting everybody. And uh, they're trying to control it. And so um, the Fed, uh, despite what some people are saying, I think is doing a pretty good job of uh, from starting late to try to uh, combat it. But it's... Um, there's a lot of different moving pieces, as we know, and it's very geopolitical. A lot of has to do with energy, yeah. oil. When you see gas, uh, you know, oil up at $90 a barrel, it throws a lot of things off because there's such a huge watershed effect of that, uh, not just going to the gas pumps and filling up your car, but going to the grocery store and everything else that, that uh, entails that. So we're living in interesting times. Uh, d and uh, another thing that throws a wrench in it is the, uh, the elections that are coming up in the United States. How so? Uh, well, look, um, fiscal policy is extremely important when you're dealing with the economy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, the actions have consequences. And so different policies do uh, have consequences, and we've seen that with energy. Uh, in the United States and how we were in energy independent at one point. Yeah. Now we're not, and that's definitely causing um, more pain. inflation and more pain. You said that, you know, you think that the Fed has kind of behaved fairly well so far, but what do you think it could do next and what are the right kind of measures? Should we expect more interest rate hikes or maybe the time to kind of pause or even cut has come? Well, I don't think they're going to do anything this week. I think the, you know, they're pausing and then um, I think the markets, if you look at what the markets are saying, if you're trying to look at the futures, uh, they're, they're, they're thinking maybe another 25 uh, basis point hike by the end of the year. But the Fed's been telegraphing what they're going to do pretty well. And if you listen to the Chairman Paul, he basically will look at the statistics and depending on what happens, they will, you know, either raise rates. I do not foresee them uh, lowering rates anytime soon. I know that some of the economists were saying that they were hoping by the end of this year. That's not happening. Uh, now the question is, do they do it in 24? We don't know. I think it's uh, too far uh, in, in advance to, to predict what's going to happen. And too much uh, can happen between now and then. Uh, especially with the elections as well. Kind of exogenous, kind of external factors. Sure. But do you think those measures are kind of ultimately going to bring down inflation or is it really kind of out of control for them? No, it's not out of uh, control. If you look at the underlying numbers, it is coming down. There's no question that inflation is coming down. But the exogenous uh, areas like oil mm -hmm. is keeping it from, you know, really reaching the, you know, the 2% target level that the Fed is, is saying that they're trying to get to like we had before. Are they ever going to get there? I don't know. I think that we're not going to be, I think people need to get used to we're going to live in a higher interest rate environment rather than a zero interest rate environment that we had for the last several years of people uh, and some of the youngsters never knew that. Some of my older higher, colleagues tell me that. You've never lived in a world with 10% percent inflation. And you talk to some people where they've had, you know, mortgages at, you know, 15, 16, 17%, and they're like, what? Um, but that existed. So 
Um, I don't think that we're going to be at that level, but zero interest rate environment may be a thing that was uh, of the past, at least for several generations. One thing that we're noticing that there's like in Europe, I'm, I'm originally Italian, like kind of there's a sense that like the ECB has acted somewhat later, and now the rates are at a record high. But there's like it feels like Europe is having much harder time dealing with inflation than the US. Do you see any kind of decoupling going on between the two? Look, every country and every region has their own issues that they have to deal with, right? And um, there are exogenous um, uh, issues uh, for, for all of them. And uh, being late to the game, um, in my opinion, at least for the United States, was a political thing. Um, and then um, as soon as uh, 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 Chairman Powell got re-elected in there, all of a sudden uh, it wasn't a temporary thing. It was, you know, permanent, was real. So. Um, that I debate was, it seems very far away now. Yeah, so, um, and it's hard to control it, and, and the reason why, it takes probably at least a year to see the effects of what happens when you raise rates, right? And everybody's too anxious to, to really feel them. Yeah. Um, and so it's hard to land this thing. Uh, uh, but I think the fact that it's taking longer is actually working to the benefit that there's a chance that we could have a softer landing or a sideways landing, as they say. Don't you think it's, it is kind of remarkable that we haven't had like a deep, I mean, there was a lot of fear of like kind of deep recession and actually we are living in a world where there's still like kind of close to full employment mm -hmm. and high inflation, which kind of, <laughs> it's hard to get our, right, our heads around it. Uh, I, it's, it's, we've been very, very fortunate. And I think uh, the consumer which is kind of the driving force of this. I was going to get to that. So um, how, how is the consumer feeling it? Look, I mean, uh, if you look at what the economy has been through, um, the COVID situation, right? Record interest rate hikes, okay? And then you know, the disruption of the supply chain too was a big totally. part of, you know, which changed everything in the world. So that's been um, incredible how we've been, you know, just, bouncing off of this and, and resilient. The resi resilience of the economy and the consumer has been great. Now, we saw a lot of pent-up demand for the consumer during the last, you know, after COVID, mm -hmm. they all wanted to travel, they all wanted to spend some money. I was one of them. Uh, yeah, so I think we, I've, everybody probably in the audience was guilty of that, right? And they just to get out and, and do that. And you're now starting to see the effects of savings coming down, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you're starting to see the effects of mortgage rates going up, all right, going up and now what's going to happen with the real estate market? You're looking at uh, the commercial real estate market and uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of people working from home now. Uh, so there's a, there's a glut in the office. Uh, Is that going to be an issue, the commercial real estate? I think it'll, it'll, it'll find itself. Uh, it's going to take a while. Um, I think that uh, personally we took a stand and since Labor Day we're in five days a week. Okay. Um, uh, I'm in the opinion we're in the financial markets and markets are open five days and uh, I expect uh, our employees to be uh, in the office uh, five days. Now there's no question that we're a lot more lenient and we can work from home uh, and we do uh, under, in certain situations we try to give our employees a lot more leeway than we probably had in the past because mm -hmm. we've learned we can. And there's certain jobs that are, are a lot more, lend themselves more uh, to be able to work from home than others. But it's tough to develop a culture and for the younger people to learn if they're by themselves in their yeah. apartments or their homes and stuff. So um, uh, we are excited to be back and um, uh, it worked for a while and then I don't think it worked as well towards when everybody was, you know, starting to come back. Got it, got it. You also, you, you, I interrupted you whilst you were talking about consumers. Like, another thing that has kind of impacted them a lot, I was going to ask you this as a last question, but it's AI and kind of we see the strikes going on or potential strikes going on in the auto industry. How do you perceive, like, the impact of AI can be in, like, how can we kind of look at it more, be, go beyond this kind of just as a threat but also an, an opportunity? Well, AI has been around in some form 
or another for several years. We've used it in our business in different areas. Uh, people are starting to see it more. It's got more popular in the new generations of you know, chat, GPT, and everything else. So um, look, the auto strike is, is not good. It's clearly inflationary. Uh, we're going to pay more for automobiles uh, because of that. So the longer it is, the longer you know, uh, the more we're going to pay. So uh, there's consequences for, for all of that. Um, but AI um, is going to change a lot, um, and uh, we have to be ready for it. And we just got to hope that it doesn't uh, fall into people's uh, hands that can use that. In, in a bad way. Yeah. You said that you use it already a lot. Is there any kind of examples you can share? Well, look, I mean, there's, um, it makes a research analyst uh, consume a lot more information quicker, mm -hmm. right? So they can read about different companies. You know, they have some parameters that they, they, they look for, and so they can cover more companies uh, a lot quicker. We use it uh, for distribution. Okay. Uh, there's certain tendencies and stuff that we can, uh, before we sell to wholesalers, we put a lot of our funds on platforms like Morgan Stanley's, UBS's, mm -hmm. Merrill Lynch's and whatnot. Uh, but we also send to uh, RIAs. When our wholesalers pick up the phone to certain areas, we have a, uh, an idea, a propensity of who's going to buy a certain type of fund that we're launching mm -hmm. more than the next. And it makes the business so much more efficient. Excellent, that's very interesting. So we've got just over a minute left. Can't go away without asking you, where do you see the market going? Kind of what are the kind of, should it be our expectations for the next 12 months? Well, like you said, AI is very impactful. Uh, you see the, some of the equities, uh, the stock, uh, especially, um, they call it a Magnificent Seven, has a lot of the technology and the AI embedded in it. And if you look at the S&P uh, being up a lot, uh, you know, over 17% so far year to date, um, if you take out those seven, uh, you know, and equally weight it, we're closer to 5%, yeah. right, which is closer to like treasuries. Uh, so uh, they are making a big impact. I don't see the run, uh, earnings have been kind of flat. Mm. Uh, so uh, I don't see the run in equities. I think we're going to have a sideways market uh, till um, we have a definitive change in direction uh, of the Fed, and uh, we're going to start lowering rates, and then I think the, the market's going to pick up, depending on what happens with elections, too, because that could always put uh, an exogenous force on the markets. Well, on that point, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you.